I'm Tom Lang. I'm the Inland Fisheries Division Outreach Director uh, and the Director of the Texas Freshwater Fisheries Center here in Athens, Texas. Well, to really get to the history of largemouth bass in the great state of Texas, you have to really look at the history of Texas and how it's evolved. And one of those things is that uh, Texas and people, when they come to Texas, have learned that we need water, and water is a most precious resource. And so all, all across Texas, we've built reservoirs, more than 1,200 uh, reservoirs all across the state, dating back to the late 1800s. In fact, we only have one natural lake in the entire state, in Caddo Lake. When you have those reservoirs out there, uh, we go on managing those reservoirs. We're, uh, we're not just managing it to manage it for, for management's sake. We're, we're managing these resources for current and future generations of people. It is, is absolutely inherent in who we are and what we do is to serve our anglers alongside of serving the resource, right? So we're protecting and conserving the resource so we don't get too greedy on one end. We also want to try to make the best fishing that we can, right? And so it all works together. And the more fun and enjoyment that we can provide folks, the more they share that with others. And that just opens the door. Like, like why is bass fishing important? Why is it important? It's fun for one, right? But it also drives a tremendous amount of dollars that support conservation across the board for fisheries resources all across the state, well beyond largemouth bass. We need everybody to support fishing and fisheries resources and conservation, right? People that fish are just, typically good people, right? And I think when you spend time in the out of doors, when you spend time on the water, it does something to you, right? And uh, it helps to make a special person. And I think that's not just good for fishing, I think that's good for society as a whole. My name is Natalie Golstrom, and I'm our State Outreach Program Supervisor and the Toyota Sherlunker Program Coordinator. So our Sri Lanka program is all about making bigger, better bass here in Texas. And we do it with an angler industry agency partnership through Texas Parks and Wildlife, our industry partners, and the anglers that go and fish for big bass. So our Toyota Sri Lanka program, it started back in 1986 with one fish uh, lovingly named Ethel. At the time, this catch was our, our state record uh, at 1767 pounds. So that's where it started. And um, it's all about going and having anglers that catch bass that are 13 pounds or heavier and having our anglers share them with our Texas Parks and Wildlife program for a breeding program. So this is a replica of Ethel. She was our very first share longer ever shared with Texas Parks and Wildlife. She was caught by Mark Stevenson, uh, weighed in at 17.67 pounds, and was our state record at the time. Caught from Lake Fork when uh, Mark Stevenson caught his fish. He actually called Texas Parks and Wildlife and said that he would like to share her with our agency. So we brought her back to Spawner, and she was the one that kicked off our Sherlinker program, started all of our big bass. And that's, that's the Ethel that everybody knows from Bass Pro Shops, right? It is one and the same. So after she was with us, uh, she was at uh, the Granddaddy store over at Bass Pro Shops, and she lived there for an additional nine years. And um, people from across the, the United States went to go and visit Ethel. I mean, millions of people, mm -hmm. yeah. And she was kind of the, one of the main poster children for catch and release fishing at the time. She was right at that era where people were catch and harvest to the catch and uh, weigh and release. How long did Ethel hold the state record? Uh, she held the record from 1986 to 1992 when uh, Barry Sinclair caught an 18.18 pound largemouth bass, again, over at Lake Fork. Wow. So, and Lake Fork record at 18.18 pounds still stands today. Incredible. So uh, this is really fascinating. If you could walk me through how you're able to track the ancestry sure. of what you're doing with Sherry Lunker. Yeah, so with our Sherry Lunker program, every 13 pound bass that comes in to Texas Parks and Wildlife, we take genetic samples off of them and we can compare them and say whether or not there's any kind of relationship with any of the other Sherry Lunkers that have ever been shared with the program. So we're actually able to trace some of our current fish, um, like the C.R. Stevenson fish from Lake Coleman uh, that was caught in uh, 2021. We can relate his fish all the way back to Sherry Lunker number nine. Wow. 
The ninth share link are ever shared with Texas Parks and Wildlife caught over in Gibbons Creek. And you're doing that through scale samples? We're doing it not only through scale samples, but we also take a small fin clip um, from these legacy class bass that come in. So um, we're able to tell the same information from scales versus fin clips. So both are incredibly valuable to our geneticists and to our biologists. Wow, that's crazy. How many of how many fish are you, are you tracking all fish ancestry? We are, yeah. yes. So this is just one piece of our bigger picture. And it's it's the one that highlights some of the best examples of what we're actually seeing with our Sherlunker lineage. We're seeing um, like over here, um, Sherlunker 410 um, was brought back here to our hatchery. Um, paired up with a male broodfish, and that we saw that there's multiple siblings that were spawned from that match, and that those are also creating other Sherlunkers down the line. And these are all record records that are coming back, that you're tracing back to the original record back in 1988. Yes, that's, that's incredible. correct. Yeah. And we're seeing uh, relationships like down at the bottom, where you know, you're getting that mother-daughter connection, you're having mother, having two sisters, and then we're also seeing recaptures as well. So these fish are coming here um, to our hatcheries. They're being taken care of by our teams here. They're um, going into a raceway to spawn. They're being returned back out to the reservoir to the angler that caught them um, so that they're released in the reservoir that they were caught in. And then they're being caught again. And there was one fish, uh, the same fish was caught three years in a row. Wow. Brought back right. here to- Three different times. Wow, that's incredible. That's really fascinating stuff. All right, so what are we looking at right here, Natalie? These are what we're calling our Lone Star Bass. So they're pure Florida largemouth bass, and they have a parent or grandparent that was a Sherlunker bass that proved that they have the genetics to become a 13-pound bass. Wow. So whenever our biologists are requesting that a Florida largemouth bass goes into a, a public reservoir in Texas, that we're stocking these Lone Star Bass. So we're able to put Sherlunker genetics uh, out in a lot more reservoirs at a lot higher frequency than we would have if we were just bringing back these 13 pound bass for breeding. Do you have enough data at this point to know what percentage of these fish are likely to get caught and brought back to this facility? Oh gosh, that's hard to know. So we've, we've only done one year of stocking of these Lone Star Bass. This is our second year. And we know that it's probably gonna take them about 10 years to become a 13 pound bass. So it'll take a little bit of time to know whether or not, um, how many of the ones that we're stocking out hatched here at our facilities are being caught and shared back with our Sherlunker program. But with our genetics, if our anglers are willing to share some scale samples off their fish, we'll, we'll be able to know that information. How old are these fish in this tank? These are one year old. I think we put them out here at the end of our spawning season last year. Gotcha. So Natalie, it's my understanding that these fish are pretty significant to the entire program. Can you give us a little bit of a background of what these two fish are? Yeah, so these two fish right here, they're skin mounts, and they were two of our state record largemouth bass uh, caught by John Alexander Jr. So he caught them, I wanna say within a month of each other, and he broke his own state record. Within a month? Within a month. And these are skin mounts, and this is not what people are typically doing these days, correct? That's correct, yeah. Generally, if an angler catches a, a bass that they want to have on their wall, um, skin mount isn't usually the way that they go, but back in the day, that's what they used to do. But now we can make um, other replicas where you can take some measurements of your fish and kind of send those in to have something kind of modeled. But these, these fish were right at the very turn where people were harvesting their fish after a tournament versus um, a catch, weigh, and release. Gotcha. So they so were right at the pivotal moment. 1972, these two fish were caught, and they held the record until 1992. Is that correct? I think so. Yeah. And, but from that point forward, these fish don't even register on the, the list yet. 
No, anymore. so um, we actually keep a list of all of our top 50 largemouth bass that have ever been uh, weighed in in the state. And while these two used to be our state records, they don't even make our top 50 list anymore. That's incredible. They've been kind of, their records have been busted and now they're off of our list because so many other bigger bass have been caught. And it, this was like right at the very turn where we were starting to begin our Florida largemouth bass stocking. So they're two very pivotal fish in our history of largemouth bass management. I, I want to see the top 10 wall. All right. All right. <laughs> these are the current top 10 share lunkers, but these aren't skin mounts anymore. No, these, these are fiberglass replicas, um, and they were made by our partners at Lake Fork Taxidermy, uh, just off of Lake Fork. So That is these. incredible. And these are our top 10 share lunkers that have ever been caught and submitted into our program. So they would have all been brought to our spawning facility. Wow, so you've got Ethel represented in here. We have our very first shell anchor up the top, left-hand corner, Ethel, but caught by Mark Stevenson over at Lake Fork at 17.67 pounds. She was our state record at the time until uh, the one on the far right, top corner, was caught by Barry Sinclair um, in 92. And that's our current state record largemouth bass, weighing at 18.18 .18 pounds, caught over in Lake Fork. So what you might notice about most of these shale lunkers that are on our top 10 wall is that Lake Fork is one of our top producing shale lunker reservoirs in the state. But we are starting to see that there's a lake OHIV over in West Texas that's starting to turn in some really big bass right now. So back in 2022, Brody Davis caught a 17.06 pound largemouth bass over at Lake OHIV. And that's the current uh, lake record for that reservoir. And um, what's significant about it is it's the largest bass that's ever been caught in the last 30 years. The state record currently stands and has stood since uh, for, for over 30 years with all of the effort and investment that the state has made over the last 40, 50, 60 years to make the bass fishery what it is. It's only a matter of time until Barry St. Clair um, loses that top spot. You know, how long do you think it's gonna take until we see the next state record? Oh gosh, based on what we've seen in our Sri Lanka program with other top 50 bass being caught in the last few years, it could just be the next season. All right, I think we wanna go see the tank room. Okay. We usually stop there, bring her in here. We work her up in the cooler, so we, we sedate her, work her up, uh, make sure that she's looking really good. If she has any scrapes, which yeah. you know sometimes they do, just bumps and bruises. Yeah. And oh, me a sporn and a Band-Aid? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> almost. Um, they're all going to be painted on the inside. They've actually seen that there's um, better survival of the Sherlanker bass. If you paint the insides gray, kind of makes them feel more kind of secure that they're not open water vulnerable. And then um, the plastic over there, those are uh, mocking uh, structure plants. And then um, cloud cover. the top is cloud cover. Natalie, what are these other contraptions in here? So these are McDonald jars. So when our fish are out in our raceways, we have special mats. And so they'll actually bring in uh, the share lunker eggs into here. And we have a special chemical that we kind of uh, make them, because bass eggs are kind of sticky. Yep. So we have a chemical that kind of takes them off the mat and we'll actually put them in our McDonald jars here. Makes the water go around the eggs so that they don't all just sit and kind of die, suffocate, or mold. So it continually moves the, the oxygen and the air and the water around the eggs. Got it. So as soon as those eggs um, start to hatch out, we actually bring them over to the trays over here. So we actually bring the fry over here. We fill up um, these with water and we let the fry grow a little bit. So all of the fry will have their egg sac, or yolk sac on them still. And so as soon as they absorb that, um, they'll kind of begin free swimming. So once they're all up in the water column, we actually take all of the fry out here and we end up putting them in our hatchery ponds for about a month until they're about fingerling size, which is about an inch and a half, two inches long. Got it. And that's when we stock them out in public waters, Texas. That's so cool. Uh, and they're gonna set these up for round two. So these must be a year or more older? I know that these are lone side brooders and I don't know if they're female or male. And let me- Do you keep males separate from females? Yeah, in the pre 
pre-spawn period. Yeah, so our females are kept in a different holding pond out there than the males areas so that as the bass are spawning that they can't see one another. Uh, because if a bass can see another bass while it's spawning, it, it won't pick that spot for its nest. Can't see they appreciate other. privacy like the rest of us. Yeah. <laughs> the Freshwater Fishery Center here in Athens, Texas, um, was one of my best memories as a child. I got to come when I was about 11 and uh, I got to fish in the stock pond that they have here. I got to catch a couple fish and then walking around seeing the tanks and all the bass and catfish just led me to want to fish more each and every day. Um, we had a tournament a couple years ago and my dad and my son came with me and we stayed here at Lake Athens in the RV park. And this is right next door to the lake. So while I was out on tournament day, my dad brought my oldest son Spencer over. He was about three or four and they got to come in and go through a tour and Spencer actually got to fish in the stock pond too and catch a fish. The work that the fishery center does here with conservation, I mean, it allows us to go out and chase dreams make memories and pass that on to children for years to come.